Who could carry that kind of weight? It was mine too Till I made And I was breathing but not alive You come my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness To you each day You come my name
In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past and present wrong. And holder of my future days to come. Your presence is ever to me. Jesus is the bread of life. 
And this morning, we're in an encounter that is one of the more famous and also one of the more enigmatic of the Gospel of John. This is the death and resurrection of Lazarus. So we're in John chapter 11. And what's happened so far, Jesus has been in, uh, in conversation, uh, in argument with the religious authorities in Jerusalem, and he has left that area. And now he is considering going back because he hears that one of his beloved friends is ill. Uh, there are three siblings, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. It's this family. Lazarus is the one who's ill. And when he hears that, he decides to wait two days before he goes. Because uh, he has this idea of what he's going to do, what we're going to see in the story. And his, his disciples are saying, don't go back there <laughs> because that's where your enemies are. You're going to get yourself crucified. Um, and he says, I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. He waits two days. He goes down there. And when he goes down there, Lazarus is dead. And so what he encounters when he walks into this, this scene is a, a whole room full of people in grief, a whole room full of people mourning. Um, and this is where we start. Um, so John chapter 11, verse 17, brings us to his encounter with Martha. And he comes up, Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, and Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. That's your memory verse for this week. But the story goes on because after he has an encounter with Martha, he comes and has an encounter with Mary. She goes back and she gets her sister. She brings her sister out. Mary comes to him, also weeping. Uh, and then all the mourners who were in the house with her, it says the Jews came with her. Um, they went consoling her, and then Mary got up quickly and went out and followed her. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet. She said to him, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. And then some of them also said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Well, the story goes on, but I want to pause there for a second because I want us to think about that scene. Jesus, or Jesus has chosen to wait two days before traveling to meet this beloved family of him and his, knowing full well what's going to happen, um, knowing what he plans to do. And then when he comes, he's confronted by grief and by anguish and by uh, faith that has been tried. And so you hear Martha saying, if you'd been here, my brother would have died. And even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Um, and Mary is saying, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And what happens in this particular scene is one of the most nuanced and enigmatic of the New Testament. And I will say, um, I've, I've seen a whole lot of interpretations of this, a whole lot of sermons on this. Anyone who tells you this story is easy is either not telling you the, the truth or has not done their full homework. Because when you look at the language that's employed and what Jesus goes through, there's no really easy interpretation of what's happening. Because those words, what happens after Jesus comes, so Jesus makes a decision to stay, and then he comes and he shows up, and he sees the scene of grief. And then what, what happens is this huge emotional reaction within him. 
And the Greek words uh, that get translated different ways in different directions, uh, you heard it's translated greatly troubled, it's disturbed, it's deeply moved. Um, those words mean agitated, they mean disturbed. They're not positive words. There's a connotation of anger. There's a connotation of uh, being really, really upset. Um, in fact, the, the word agitated is the same word that's used later when they describe the, the waters in the pool of Bethany getting agitated, getting riled up. That's the word that's used. And then we come down and Jesus, it literally says Jesus looks at Mary weeping and looks at the Jews weeping. And then Jesus himself begins to weep. And that in and of itself is one of the most poignant lines in the entire New Testament. Because it tells us something about the nature of God, the nature of Christ, of the nature of our faith. You see, what we see in that story, in that interaction, however you're going to interpret that, is that Jesus is not callous or dismissive of human suffering. Jesus doesn't write off the tears of Mary and the tears of the mourners. Jesus doesn't sweep in and tell them, it's all going to be okay and you just don't have enough faith. <laughs> Jesus doesn't ride in on his white horse, even knowing what he's about to do. He doesn't ride in on his white horse and simply tell them, there's no need for you to cry now because everything is going to be okay. Jesus sees their suffering and then begins to weep. And whatever else is in this text, what we learn is this. Our God understands the human cost related with suffering. Our God understands that even if there is a good ending coming, the suffering that we go through along the way costs us something. The tears that we shed along the way are not meaningless and not trivial, and the agony of soul that we sometimes go through in this life is not something to be discounted. And the reason I think this is an important thing to point out, for two reasons. First of all, um, Christians are sometimes the worst about discounting suffering. And part of it, I think, is for good reason. It's because we know the end of the story. We know the end is good. We know everything's Resurrection is the final word. Everything's going to be redeemed. And so we are terrible sometimes at swooping in to somebody who is in the midst of life falling apart and saying, there is no need to cry. Everything's going to be okay in the end. And what we see in the story instead is the exact opposite. Jesus doesn't come in and do this. Jesus does not dismiss or discount human suffering because he understands that there is a cost to us of living through the brokenness of the world that we live in. And that cost is there even if we know it's going to be redeemed. And that tells us, that's a word I think for Christians in talking to other people, but I want to say it this. It's a word for Christians in dealing with themselves. Because what I have seen over and over again is very good, well-intentioned, faithful people who think that they are not allowed to mourn because they believe Jesus is risen. And think they are not allowed to be scared because they believe Jesus is risen. And they think that they're not allowed to be disturbed in spirit because they know the good end that's coming. And the word of the Lord in the story this morning is that is not true. Because the human creature is a creature that as we move through the brokenness of this world, there are costs and there are consequences and it hurts. And that is not trivial and that is not something to be discounted. And when Jesus himself stepped into the scene of witnessing the emotional cost to a woman of having lost her brother two days ago, he wept. And I think there's a word for Christians. Sometimes weeping is the appropriate response. Sometimes disturbance of spirit is the appropriate response. And sometimes acknowledging how fearful 
and how hurtful the days have been is the correct response to the season we've just been through. There's a story that was told to me of a, uh, a woman who had been one of the few survivors on an airline air, airplane crash. It was one of those terrible instances where the plane went down and they, they got a handful of people off, but hundreds died and, and five or six were saved. And so what she was told over and over and over again, as soon as she came out, as soon as she got out of the hospital, was how lucky she was and how blessed she was. You are so lucky, you are so blessed, you are so, you walked away with life and all these other people died and she couldn't understand why she didn't feel like that. And she went on and on and on until finally she went to a counselor and she sat down and the first thing the counselor said to her was she looked her in the eye and she said, yeah, it really was that bad. And this woman just started crying because what she had been what she was trying to believe was, I'm lucky, I'm lucky, I'm lucky, this is all going to end well. But what she was living through was this memory of having seen so many people die. And the cost to her soul of having gone through that experience. And friends, listen, we are in a season now where everyone is going to be cost something. Everyone is going to go through something in the next couple of months. Uh, and I realize that there's a lot of uncertainty at this point exactly what that's going to be and what that's going to look like. But the, the truth of where we are as a society now is even for people who are not at all worried about their health, there are going to be financial consequences, there are going to be security consequences. There are people who right now have lost their job this week and you don't know how they're going to make ends meet. There are people who do not know how they're going to pay bills in the next two months. There are people who do not know if their business is going to survive. And all of that is not insignificant. And the Christians who tell you it is have not fully wrestled with this story. Sometimes walking into the cost of human suffering means that we acknowledge what it has cost us as humans. The good news is that it's not the end of the story. And that's not even the end of this story. And I spent a whole lot of time on that because I think it's important to get in order to get the rest of it. But if we just stop there, we might as well all give up, right? <laughs> if we just stop there and there is no good news, and all we can do is get in touch with our feelings, and that is the end of the story, and the good news of this morning is, of course, that is not the end of the story. The reason Christians rush past that point is that that's the hard point, which is why we need to acknowledge it. But the reason Christians rush past that point is that they know that there is another side coming. Because what happens in Christianity is that Jesus takes our suffering, and rather than discounting it, he redeems it. So the end of the story is this. Jesus, after weeping, after being angry, after being troubled in spirit, goes to the tomb. A stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead for four days. That's a very nice Bible way of saying he stinks because he's decomposing. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you'd see the glory of God? So they went and they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and he said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you would always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here that they may believe you've sent me. And when he said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came and his hands and his feet with strips of cloth were bound. And Jesus said to him, then, unbind him and let him go. So the end of the story is this movement from Jesus acknowledging and seeing the depth of human suffering and then moving forward and redeeming death into resurrection and redeeming suffering into joy and redeeming brokenness into wholeness. And what I love about this story most of all so in the, in, in the Christian understanding of, of, of the great story of the world is that is things 
fundamentally things, broken things got fixed. So the, the things got broken in Genesis 3, God is working to fix things along the way. And ultimately there will be a new creation, a resurrection of the dead, and all things will be made new. And that is what we are all going toward. What I love about the story is the resurrection we see in Lazarus is fundamentally not the ultimate resurrection of the dead, right? So presumably Lazarus isn't raised and it's just going to live forever. <laughs> Lazarus is raised to live the rest of his life and then to die a natural death with his sisters by his side. Lazarus was raised in this life to provide joy and comfort to that family in this life and to, as a precursor of the good end that is coming for them and for all creation at the end of the story. And what I love about this story is it, it brings home what Jesus says in the memory verse, which is this, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even when they die, yet shall they live, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Notice the present tense of that phrase. I am the resurrection and the life. What he's doing there is he is saying, yes, the end is good, but you don't have to wait for the end for the goodness of the future to begin to shine into your present. The end of the story is resurrection, but you don't have to wait until the end of time for the rays of the coming dawn to begin to glow into your present, you do not have to wait until the eschaton for the resurrection to become a reality in your life now. I am the resurrection and the life. It's like if someone had come to Jesus saying, I'm looking for heaven, and he says to them, I am heaven. And it's present tense, and it's right here, and it's right now, and it is fundamentally the message of wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you are going through, Jesus has the power to shine the light of eternity on you here and now. Jesus has the power to bring the rays of the coming dawn that will someday rise over all of the created order and to bring it into your life here and now and it will change everything even though even though you are still in your mortal body you know one of the things we learn from from this passage and from especially going forward is that there's a fundamental difference here between biological life and spiritual life biological life starts dying the moment we were born. Every moment, we are dying. Every moment, we get a little closer. Every moment, there are cells being shed and, and, and things changing within our bodies. One of the things I, I didn't realize until I was a child is that when you have a baby, you only get a baby. You get a newborn for two weeks, and the newborn's gone. And then you get a baby for six months, and then the baby's gone. And then you get a toddler for an eternity, actually, that lasts forever. But then the toddler's gone, and then you get a child, and then you get a teenager, and there's no keeping them at any of those stages, because that's how biological life works. We are growing and growing and growing and growing, and we are always growing toward death. And most of us feel within ourselves a sense of grief at the goodness that is lost in every stage of that growing and that losing. And that grief comes from our longing for the spiritual life, because the difference between biological life and spiritual life is that spiritual life is eternal. And in the spiritual life, nothing good is ever lost. And the reason we grieve when we see things die is because there's a part inside of us that knows nothing good should be lost forever. And the spiritual life that Jesus brings in us is the life that lives forever, in which nothing good is ever lost, in which tears are wiped away, in which the brokenness and the suffering of all creation is redeemed into a resurrected new creation that shines with the light of Christ and gives glory to God. This whole series we've been talking about what it means to have spiritual life in our lives. 
uh, over and on top of the biological life. And this morning, the word of the Lord is this. That spiritual life, when you invite it in, when you love Jesus the way he loves you, when you reach out and trust God and take that step of faith to become the person God wants you to be, you begin to live in the sunrise of heaven. And it doesn't mean we won't suffer because we will. And it doesn't mean this life won't hurt because it will. It doesn't mean our, our physical bodies won't die because they will, because we are still in the biological broken world. But it means that in light of all of that, we, are we begin to live in the light of eternity. And the light of eternity means this. In the love of God, nothing good is ever lost. All tears are wiped away. Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes in the morning. My friends, the word of the Lord this morning is this, that is true, always. That is true on the days when the stock market is booming, and on the days you don't think you're going to be able to retire. That is true on the days you have a job and the days you don't. That is true on the days your family is safe and healthy. And on the days you're not sure they're going to live much longer. That is true on the days that you are secure in your future and the days that you are fearful, the days of heaven. Jesus is always the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him, even though they die, they shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in him will never die. Do you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God. In a time of uncertainty, we put our trust in you. In a time of fear, we put our hope in you. In a time of anguish, we place our tears in your hands. And we bring to you that is within us, knowing that you will neither dismiss nor discount the suffering we have endured in this world, but that you will wrap us up in your scarred hands and match our tears with yours as you point us toward the future. And we believe and we trust the future is good. And even if weeping lingers through the night, joy, joy, joy comes in the morning. As we say, as we all pray together the prayer our Lord taught, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, friends, if you were here this morning, <laughs> we would say that this is the time to consider what you need to give to God. We would pass around an offering basket, and we would give you the text to give number. And I'm going to tell you, um, this is still your time. This is still your next two minutes to consider the ways that you can give yourself back to God. Uh, the offering is absolutely still available. You can find it on the website. There's a text to give number on the website you can find too. If that's easier. Uh, Westminster, like many other businesses, is going to strive to keep paying people even if they cannot show up because of the illness. And that's going to be hard for us without a Sunday morning offering. And so we... Uh, we encourage your generosity, and we encourage you to keep giving as long as you can. But this is about more than that. 
our giving of ourselves to God is financial, but it's not just financial. It's a giving of our whole selves. It's a giving of our trust, a giving of our prayers, of our presence, of our gifts, of our service, and of our witness. And so here is your gift for this week. You've got two minutes. Pray, get along with God, get right in your spirit about what it means to give all of yourself this week to the God who gave all of himself to you.
Uh, if you go to our website, they've completely redone our website with all of the new offerings we have out there. And I just want to say a word. Even if you are not a member of the Westminster community, if you have no idea where Westminster United Methodist Church is, but you want people to connect with during this time, you are welcome. You can come into any of our Zoom calls, you can come into our Facebook group. We're here for you. Um, we want to connect people to God and to each other. And so what we have this, uh, this morning, actually, we have a Zoom call that's going to happen for adult Bible study. Everyone is welcome to join in. Uh, go to the website. Um, there's a link for the Zoom Bible studies. You can see that very easy. Just click on the link. You can join it that way. We are going to have children's Sunday school on the Westminster Kids Facebook page in about, at about 10.15. Uh, we will post the link to that on the Facebook page so you can get easy access to that. Hope Hooper is going to be doing that. On, on the main Facebook page at about 10.15, 10.20, we're going to have Josh Rodriguez lead a Sunday school for youth. Um, and I will say, we don't check IDs at any of this. And so if you think you fit in better with the youth than you do with the adults, you are welcome to join the Youth Facebook Live Sunday School class. Uh, and then we're just going to keep going throughout the week. We've got Bible studies offered throughout the week. Um, a Tuesday morning, I think, and a Wednesday evening. Double check on the website, though. Whatever's on the website is the correct information. Of Zoom Bible studies, we have a new Facebook group that we've opened specifically for Westminster folks to be able to connect and to talk about life in quarantine. Um, and so we invite you to use that. Uh, and then we just invite you to keep checking back in because we're going, we are going to be flexible over the next several weeks about how best to connect you guys with God with each other. We are grateful for your patience, we're grateful for your suggestions, we're figuring things out as we go along, uh, but we are we are going to have them figured out at, uh, at least before Jesus comes, it is the plan. Um, any other announcements I'm forgetting? I think that's, it. that's about it. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, our final hymn, led by our amazing, isn't he amazing? I'm oh, sorry. I sound like that, let's see. Our final hymn, led by Chris, is going to be What Wonder Slow Is This? And I will say, y'all, the experience is much better when you actually sing. You know I can't see you right now, but I can kind of see you right now. You're like in your car or your living room, and you're kind of embarrassed about singing out loud. You know what? You know what? Jesus wasn't embarrassed about singing out loud. So you should, wherever you are, sing out loud, join us in our final song, What Wonder Slow Is This? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul? For my soul to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is Soul, for my soul to lay us. 
wherever you may be and whatever your situation looks like. Go forth knowing that the faithfulness of God is greater than the broken world around you. Go forth knowing that the joy of God is greater than the sorrow of this world. And go forth knowing that in the love of God, nothing good is lost forever. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.